In 2000, Simon & Schuster published what is widely regarded as the world's first mass market ebook, Stephen King's Riding the Bullet. The book's popularity was wild. Avid, constant readers downloaded more than 400,000 copies in the first 24 hours. Later that same year, King also published The Plant, a second ebook which he published directly via his website. Nearly a decade before the first Kindle would ever even be released, Stephen King was blazing the trail for the future of publishing. But one piece of this story is often left out. One year before The Plant and Riding the Bullet, Stephen King published his novella Everything's Eventual on CD-ROM. Hi, my name is Matty and I am stoked to talk to you about Stephen King's F-13. Before the rise of this cheeky fella, Stephen King was the best-selling adult author on the planet. And I say adult because last Halloween I covered another late 90s CD-ROM based on another world heavyweight publishing sensation, Goosebumps. But anyway, every year since 1981, Stephen King had had a book in the top 10 bestsellers, with a lot of those, in fact, being the number one spot. Stephen King's popularity meant the 1990s was thick with adaptations of his books. Now, I've made a case before that the late 90s was a bit of a peak for horror fans, with horror very briefly becoming a successful part of mainstream culture. I don't think it would be reaching to say that this is in fact largely due to the impact of Stephen King. His works had impacted every form of home entertainment at this point, and so why not computers? Specialist materials like dictionaries or encyclopedias, they had been published on CD-ROM as far back as the 1980s. And by the mid-1990s, companies like Dorling Kindersley were also publishing their work on CD-ROM. Fiction had been published digitally before, but never really in a mass market format. If you were going to pick one author from this time period to be the face of this burgeoning new digital revolution, you'd have to choose Stephen King. In 1999, Blue Byte Software published Stephen King's F-13, a digital copy of Stephen King's short story Everything's Eventual, packaged with a bunch of CD-ROM content as a value-added offering. F-13 was developed by Presto Interactive. Presto, by this point, were probably most famous for their point-and-click epic The Journeyman project. I feel like this is a good fit as a developer. The atmosphere and the presentation in F13 is a really solid match, and it's pretty cool going into the book. You know, you've got this interactive book player, there's even a button to add and remove a bookmark. I was genuinely expecting to go into this and it was just going to be like a plain text document with maybe a spinner down the side. That, that was really all I thought we'd get. But what we've got is a nice little paper texture, there's a tasteful typeface choice. It's all very readable and it's all really well presented. I think this is a good match for PCs of the time. Reading an entire novel in this format? might be a bit of a push, but a short story that you can very easily read in one sitting? I think this is pretty good. F13, in fact, is the first time Everything's Eventual was ever published in a mass media format, and in 1999, this was the only way you could own this story. Dink Earnshaw is a bit of a dimwit. He's your typical 90s slacker character, but what makes Dink different is he has the unique ability to draw shapes that make people want to kill themselves. The first time he uses it, he kills someone who's bullying him at work. He's soon picked up by a shadowy, mysterious company called the Trans Corporation. They set him up with his own place to live, they pay his bills for him, he's got cable TV, the internet, a sick new computer, and all Dink is asked to do in exchange is to use his ability to send his incantations all over the world via email to people stipulated by the Trans Corporation. This is perfect for someone like Dink. All of his worries are taken care of, his bills are paid, his responsibilities are all taken care of, but he doesn't ever question who he's being asked to target. At first, he might assume that he's 
toppling dictators or bringing down gangsters, but we figure out much sooner than Dink does that he's being manipulated into essentially being an unwitting supervillain. He's definitely destabilizing regimes and killing crime bosses, but not for the benefit of America or not for the benefit of the world, but for the benefit of his employer. Dink's first murder is very personal. It's definitely evil, but at least we can understand why he does it. And he then spends time being affected by that murder. Once he starts killing people over the internet, the detachment of never having to see his victims insulates him from any guilt that he might otherwise feel. He can hide behind the idea that this isn't personal to him. This is just business. This is his job. He can just hold his hands up and be like, hey, I'm just a microscopic cog in this catastrophic plan, man. I think what King is showing us here is evil doesn't have to be showy. There are people right now working for big companies that are bringing hurt and misery to our world. And I don't mean evil people, I mean normal looking white collar office workers just visiting casual evils all over the world to the benefit of their employer. When I was reading this, I got to wondering, just how many emails do you think have ever been sent that have actually resulted in somebody getting killed? Everything's eventual foreshadowed a lot of what we know now about internet culture, about how online anonymity can bring out the very worst in people, how that anonymity can insulate us from the consequences or accountability of our actions, saying and doing horrible things and just firing it off into the internet and never having to worry about any impact that it might make. And this is where King absolutely shines. I think it's very easy in a story to point at a big shiny red pointy devil and go, oh yeah, look, he's evil. But this is a story about the banality of real evil. And King is never better than when he's writing about this stuff in short stories. He gives you this tiny little taste at the beginning of the story, pulling you into this much bigger mystery with much bigger themes than you originally realize. And even though the story's really short, he still manages to mislead you and take you down these different alleyways and keeping you guessing all the way through. And by the time you figured it out, the story's already over and you're left with your head spinning. You're like completely dizzy. It's like you've just been spun around like an astronaut in a centrifuge, except one that's like full of skulls and all bats and that. As this video is about a CD-ROM and not a book, I suppose I should spend at least some time talking about the rest of the software. F13 of course wasn't just a book, it was a suite of software. The disc contains a bunch of games, screensavers, desktop backgrounds and even sound effects which you can use to customise Windows. These sorts of desktop companion slash entertainment suites were really common back in the 1990s. The games themselves are exactly the sort of thing that you'd see on the spinner rack in Dixon's in around 1997. They're really simple little clicky games, just fun little time wasters. Lottie said that they're the sort of thing that she could see herself playing as a teenager at the back of the living room on the family PC with her headphones on, <laughs> just clicking away non-stop until her mum just would have turned around and said, do you have to be clicking so much, please? Yes, mum, God! The, the screensavers are a laugh they're fine and I definitely back in the day customized our family installation of Windows 95 with all kinds of desktop backgrounds and sounds and so on editing the start menu just to play the sound of a dog barking every time you click on something I mean come on that's a right laugh had I owned F13 at the age of 15 I'm pretty sure I would have absolutely loved this I have seen modern reviews of F13 and all they seem to do is just rag on the fact that F13 is a series of bad games. But F13 isn't a game to me. This is software. This is a product which is aiming to blur the lines between traditional book publishing and electronic entertainment. It's experimental. It's pushing the boundaries of what we considered to be interactive entertainment in the late 1990s. Without it, we may never have had Riding the Bullet. We may never have had The Plant. If nothing else, F13 is a landmark in the history of the ebook. And besides, if you'd bought a paperback novel and in the back it had like a couple of crosswords and a Sudoku, 
You wouldn't rag on the entire book if the crosswords weren't very good. And, and that's how I choose to view F13. It's a book with some fun little time wasters and some screensavers added on. And why would you even rag on these? These are some of the gnarliest screensavers you could ever hope to have on the family pooter. One of them is a quiz, and Lottie and I honestly sat for about 25 minutes just watching this screensaver with the questions rolling in, just so we could see who was the biggest Stephen King fan. Stephen King's work has often had a healthy scepticism about technology. And at the end of the 1990s, with the infinite potential of the internet stretched out in front of us, I think a lot of people felt the same way. And my point is, for somebody who is so clearly at arm's length from technology, it's incredibly cool that Stephen King was the de facto leader for the digital publishing revolution, but also was a key player in this early skepticism about the rise of new tech conglomerates and what they would mean for the future of the world. I think this is just a great little time capsule that really encapsulates a lot of that paranoia and a lot of that skepticism of the time. Along with riding the bullet and the plant, the oft-forgot F13 paved the way for digital publishing. And it's been really fun today to take a look at this through that lens and, and to remember that. And I hope if you've got this far through the video, then you've also got a kick out of it and you've had a fun time as well. Thanks very much for watching this one. If you like weird, obscure old CD-ROMs or spooky stuff from the late 90s, then uh, subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks very much. Ta-da.